This is the Sean Hannity Show podcast. First great purge I referred to was in 2009, but that wasn't the last one. There was another great purge in 2012 when they didn't just modify the records. They completely eliminated them out of the system, which com- bypasses the security protocol for the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, it may not have mattered except for one tragic consequence. The masjid in San Bernardino and the one in Fort Pierce were directly related to the case of those 67 records that were deleted out of the system. Mr. Haney, would you elaborate on on how potentially focusing on this threat might have helped prevent the San Bernardino terrorist attack or the Orlando terrorist attack? The networks are made up of individuals and organizations. And individuals don't exist without a network of organizations. You have to look at both of them. That's why there's no such thing as a lone wolf terrorist, because they don't function in a vacuum outside the, the, the uh, structure of the community, just like planets don't rotate around the sun without the gravitational force to hold them in place. So to look at these acts as separate from the community is a, is a flaw, because we're looking first of all, at tactics, not strategy. The strategy is implementation of Sharia law. If we only look on tactics, they are kaleidoscopic and they will change constantly and we can never acquire a target. If we understand that the underlying strategy of the global Islamic movement, then we understand why these organizations exist in the first place. And then we understand why the people that go there are going to be affected by that gravitational force, if you will, and orbit their lives around that central structure. That's why the mosque in Fort Pierce is called Islamic Center, because it provides a center to their life. I'm here today taking time away from my family, work, during this last week of our holiest month of Ramadan, a time of fasting and deep atonement, because I could not feel more strongly that our current national and agency direction in combating Islamist-inspired terrorism is deeply flawed and profoundly dangerous. As a devout Muslim who loves my faith and loves my nation, the de-emphasis of radical Islam is the greatest obstacle to both national harmony and national security. Wholesale denial of the truth by many in our government and political establishment is not only dishonest, it infantilizes Muslims while lying to the American people, but it actually emboldens the extremists on both sides of this debate. That was testimony given yesterday by Phil Haney, as uh, he's been on the program before, a founding member of our Department of Homeland Security. You remember we interviewed him at length because when Obama became president in 2009, all the intelligence that they had gathered over a six-year period of time about individuals tied to radical groups They were told to scrub those names from the Department of Homeland Security database. Also, that was Dr. Zudi Jasser. He's the president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy, author of the book A Battle for the Soul of Islam, an American Muslim patriot's fight to save his faith. Now, in light of 41 dead, over 200 wounded in Turkey, our American government is still banning the use of the word jihad, a president still resistant to saying radical Islam. Now, both these guys testified on Capitol Hill yesterday, giving testimony to the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Oversight and uh, much more. The attack in Orlando, the largest since 9-11, as many Americans wondering, you know, what's going on here? Now, I have gone over an entire list in the last hour. How is it this president could be so wrong and say that ISIS is the JV team? Before the Paris attacks, ISIS was contained. How is it this president... Now, in retrospect, do we look back at his decision to release terrorists at Guantanamo Bay? Do we look back at the decision to keep open borders? Do we look back at the president giving $150 billion to the number one state sponsor of terror in Iran? Do we look back at after the Arab Spring when Mohammed Morsi became the president of Egypt, a former head of the Muslim Brotherhood, a terrorist group, and a guy that once referred to the Israelis as descendants of apes and pigs, well, why did the administration give him tanks, F-16s, and $1.5 billion taxpayer dollars? And the list goes on and on. Anyway, these two men are here with us today. Philip Haney, uh, who's now my new hero, uh, and uh, Dr. Zudi Jasser, uh, who's always been a friend. Welcome, both of you. Thank you very much. You. Glad to be here. Phil, you, uh, I've interviewed, Philip, I've interviewed you after 
Now, the Orlando attack, I've interviewed you a number of times, and one thing is very clear. You really do believe that the scrubbing of names and information from the Department of Homeland Security database may very well have contributed or at least would have provided us an attempt to stop these incidents. And it was very odd to find out that the State Department had warned about travel to Turkey on Monday. So something was up, correct? Yep, there's a, I call it a gravitational force, and it's gaining momentum around the world vis-a-vis the global Islamic movement, which is based on the the, uh, intention to implement Sharia law. I'd like to use an illustration. A couple months ago, I was with T. Boone Pickens in his office in Dallas. Everyone knows he's a commodity trader and a wildcatter. He was watching his board, a big screen board full of numbers, flashing, turning off and on, And I asked him, Mr. Pickens, what would happen if I just started randomly pulling numbers off that board? How long would it take before you would be incapable of reading the trends that you base your living on? He said, not very long. And I said, it's exactly the same way in counterterrorism. When you start eliminating the little pieces of information, what we call the dots, there comes a time when a critical mass is reached and you cannot develop cases to the probable cause level that you need to do in pro- in law enforcement. So you become blind. It's like driving down the interstate with no headlights on. You're going to eventually crash into something. And that's exactly what we're seeing. The administration's policy is crashing into events like San Bernardino, Orlando, Fort Hood, Boston, Chattanooga, and so well, on. But that goes to the heart. Why would as president, the resistance now is, is front and center. We all know he's He's incapable of of identifying the enemy radical Islamists. He says ISIS, the Islamic State, is not Islamic. He's actually said those words, the JV team. And and, and then you look at the, the phraseology that they've used, workplace violence, man caused disasters, overseas contingencies. You know, they try to thread this needle all over and over and over again. And, and now we're bearing the fruit of you not being able to connect the dots because you were told to clean out your file of dots, people connected to radicalism. So this shouldn't surprise anybody. And and Loretta no, Lynch is telling us we need to love our enemies. That's the answer, love. What's more remarkable about what happened after the Orlando shooting vis-a-vis Loretta Lynch's redaction of the transcript was that is exactly what was happening behind the scenes within the law enforcement community in terms of removing information such as my case and or what we call the rules of engagement, telling sworn officers that they should not arrest, should not deport, should not uh, put in, in, you know, watch over people that they collect at the border, but to let them go. It's across virtually every agency in the law enforcement of the U.S. government that we've been told to stand down or we've been actually handcuffed, it's only an expression of a much broader symptom within the policy of the U.S. government. Before when I... Loretta yeah, go ahead. Lynch did that, it was like a vivid display in Technicolor exactly what, how this policy in the U.S. government is manifested. We're going to remove the information in real time right in front of you. John, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Barack Obama's CIA director, John Brennan, today said, I'd be surprised if ISIS is not trying to carry out that kind of attack on the United States. Now, we also know that he acknowledged, as our FBI director acknowledged, our assistant FBI director, our national director of intelligence, our former special envoy to defeat ISIS, and our House Homeland Security Committee chairman have all said ISIS will infiltrate the refugee population like Belgium and in, in France. So all of this is now pointing in the direction that they're coming right for us. These so-called soft targets are what they're after. Um, they've been successful. We don't have uh, we have a, a, a state of denial by the administration. I mean, do we have to start from scratch now again? In your opinion, I think you'd be surprised how fast we could turn it around if we did two things. Assuming our allies win in the White House in November, what we would do is go back to the ports, meaning the airports and ports of entry in the United States, and uh, re-up the officers on how to discern, detect, and do cases at the primary level when you come into the airport, for example, and then how to connect those cases with 
the other law enforcement agencies, because, by the way, FBI and DHS do not have reciprocity as we stand today. They don't even have access to the same databases. Let me but bring se- yeah. Let me bring in Zudi Jasser. Um, I could talk to you, uh, Philip Haney, all day, Doctor Jasser. Um, let me ask you. You're hearing what Mister Haney is saying. You have been dealing with radicalism in your community, but you're a voice almost in the wilderness. You know, you look at the literal interpretation of the Quran and Hadith, and you say, "Yeah, you understand where this is coming from." And so many others that may share your moderate views, are silent because they don't want to be labeled an apostate because the penalty for apostasism is death. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I was so happy, Sean, that we had the opportunity to finally address this issue because under the guise of political correctness and the cleansing of this lexicon has, has not only put our country at risk, but it actually demonizes Muslims by telling America that, well, you know, Americans who see the problem within Islam think, well, then Muslims don't want to address it because it's all one monolithic entity. And we were there to say it's not. And there were some breakthroughs. Senator Blumenthal uh, acknowledged the points that I made, that our Muslim reform movement that includes 15 bipartisan uh, Muslims that are anti-Islamist, that believe in reform, reject Islamic State, caliphate, Sharia ideology, and have not been given platforms because the government, the media, are complicit. And at the end of the day, I'll tell you, Sean, as a patriot, I see our homeland security. Every attack sort of put on the grill is, why, what did they miss? What did they do? You can't hold them accountable when we don't use the language, because the precursors to the militant attacks is the non-militant homophobia, anti-Semitism, anti-Americanism. So those ideas, the Sharia-type ideology that is supremacist, if we're not following, how can we hold them accountable in this whack-a-mole program? So we have to be fair to Homeland Security, and if we love our country, which every Muslim I know does, we have to then give, you know, in the words of Loretta Lynch, a love, but a tough love where we acknowledge that Islam has a problem and Muslims need to deal with it. But they're not dealing with it. And they're afraid to deal with it. Isn't this really, you know, I, w- I was listening very closely to the testimony of Philip Haney, and he's talking about Sharia. You know, that goes to the heart of what Donald Trump suggested about, okay, if we can't vet people properly, we can't let them into the United States. Uh, isn't there a clash of cultures if you grow up in a country where you tell a woman how to dress that a penalty for being gay is to get killed and women can't drive and men decide if they go to school or work, etc.? Absolutely, and it's a clash of values. And you know, some of the senators in their in their uh, questioning said, "Well, you know, uh, maybe we just need to work with the peaceful Muslim." I said, "Hold on, it's not about peaceful. It's not about radical or non-radical. It's about those who share our values and those who don't." And our Muslim Reform Declaration did that. And at the end of the day, I told them, I said, "Listen, it is about the president's worldview and what partners they use. The whole reason they won't use the language." is they, when they have conferences at the White House about countering violent extremism, that axis of gravity brings in Saudi Arabia, brings in Qatar, Pakistan, Egypt, countries beholden to the Islamist right. law, to the Islamist identity. So those people cannot be partners and acknowledge they won't let us shift from countering violent extremism to countering violent Islamism. And then the inner circle of the president is Muslim Brotherhood legacy sympathizers, which I outlined in my testimony, included many members of a network of the Brotherhood in America that then works with these foreign groups in making well, that's sure what, America doesn't counter it. And that's what Philip Paney was putting together as a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security. What is your reaction, Philip, and we have less than a, a minute here, to the fact that the administration was invited to this hearing and they never showed up not one person well if they really cared the way they stayed say they care they would have showed shown up and they would have shown uh, they would have spoke at the hearing about how they are addressing the nature of the threat but the fact that they didn't come is a serious indictment i consider an abrogation of their responsibility they're public servants yeah they're well. working for us they're supposed to represent the best and the brightest of our law enforcement capacity, and they didn't even show up. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's it's a dereliction of duty if ever there was one. And now we have uh, this very day our CIA director warning all of us that this is all coming here, and I have no doubt it is. 
And it'll come here again and again. And I think the frequency of attacks ought to alarm everybody. And the fact that, you know, a president is in such a state of denial and has been so wrong so often on the defining issue of security is uh, is is just unbelievable. I want to thank you both for being with us. Philip Haney, Dr. Zudi Jasser, we appreciate it. Newt Gingrich.